welcome back to The Rich Tradition. I'm Elizabeth Luard, and here we are in the rich countryside of Ireland. Behind me is the ship victualling port of Cork. Dairy products form the basis of the fortunes of the merchants of Cork, and town and countryside are intimately interwoven. It was the farmers and peasantry who supplied the merchants with the wherewithal to trade. The city once had the largest butter market in the world. It went into decline in the 1840s and was at its heyday when the sailing ships had to be provisioned for the Atlantic. Cork was the major provisioner of the English Navy. Salted meat put up in barrels was the main item and the city's central market is still known as the English market. It's an old Irish story that the men of Cork can make a fortune where the men of Dublin would be queuing at the poorhouse. Cork is still a busy merchant city, with plenty of sailors home from the sea and in need of refreshment. So Declan, tell me why it's called the English market. Well, that's quite an interesting story. The, the, the point of it was that to, in order to get a stall in the market, you had to swear allegiance to the English crown, which meant, of course, that if you were a papist, and if you were a republican, so they kept it to their own all the time. Now that's that green kiosk. That's the toll booth for when the farmers were driving their cattle into the city to sell them at the market, they, they, the municipal toll would have been collected um, there. Somebody behind collecting the Somebody money. Somebody sitting inside there and sort of counting, you know, one, two, three, four, five, five cattle, that'll be uh, a farthing each or whatever it was in those days. It's a very handsome building. It is a lovely old building, lots of detail, including a lovely coat of arms for the city, straight up there, um, which is two castles with a ship in between, which is a, a harbour safe for ships. It says exactly what it should do, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yes indeed. The whole thing is the city was geared to being a trading port, particularly the provision trade. So the bacon would be salted and then smoked, and that was that This was evening we're to be having a bit of crack, a party, and we must have the proper Irish dinner. Because the chimneys were very broad in those days. You They'd smoke up the chimneys. Stick the whole side up, yeah. and we have to have it with cabbage. That's it. We're going to have bacon and cabbage, you see. So what would you recommend? That's got a lovely heart. Beautiful. So we need two. What do you think? Yes. You fancy that one? Cabbage and tatties are particularly fine in Ireland. Good all through the winter. Yes, that's beautiful. I like a bit of the outside. One way of keeping eggs fresh was to rub the shells just warm from the hen with butter to seal out the air. The housewives of Cork are still willing to pay a bit extra for fresh buttered eggs. On long sea voyages, eggs were sealed under butter. Two good things in one barrel. <laughs> so I'm told you cook it with white sauce. There was an awful lot of offal left over from all of that salted meat. Tripe is still Cork's favourite fast food. It's sold ready prepared. And make a white sauce. And give it another 10 to 15 minutes. And just serve it on with bread or, or potatoes, potatoes? Yeah. plain no, boiled potatoes, in their jacket. Yes. yes. And what about the drachee? That only takes four minutes. And it's cooked, okay. sliced, you or can, you can slice it. Yes. Cut the skin off and yes. place it on top of your tripe. Yes. It only takes three or four minutes. Just barely heat it. There's yes. nothing else in it. Just the sheep's blood. There's no seasoning, no spice, no breadcrumbs, nothing else. Mm -hmm. Just the sheep's blood. So, so it's very mild, very smooth, very bland and really something you want to be reared to. Yes. <laughs> in the old days, the cellarman who barreled and salted the meat was paid seven pounds of offal a day in addition to his wages. You will find offal dishes in all the ship victualling ports. Hello. Spiced beef. Yes, indeed. Here we have another spin-off from the provisioning trade. to Cork, particularly around Christmas time. In fact, around Christmas, you'd see tons of it literally coming through the market. 
and it's, it's, it's salt beef with a, with a spice crust. Now, what about the spices? What? I'm going to talk the secret, though. Well, I, I want to know the secret, because it's taking it's, it's so long to sort of perfect. But it, ha it has um, cloves, cinnamon, um, pimentos, salt, water, and some other. But that's basically it. But there's a lot of spice, you see. I mean, you don't very often get recipes that have, have that quantity of spice. A good bit of lean beef, salted and buried in spice, literally smothered so the air doesn't get in. As a trading port, Cork had access to such luxuries. Let me show you. Let me show you. into a bag. Let me just show you what we do if we, it is Christmas time. Yes. And a customer's come. Yes, right. Fish, of course. The sea is on our doorstep. Salmon, ray wings, mussels, squid, herring. This is very fresh. But what we're looking for is salt ling. Salt fish was the most important ship's provision, both as a trade item and as a store, caught in the good times, dried on the yard arm, and kept against bad weather and deep waters. In the old days, they used great big sheets of it hanging up outside the, the grocery shops in the country. It became Catholic Europe's favorite fasting food. Used to be poor man's food. Plain boiled most of the time. Plain boiled with, with tatties. Now it's a luxury. Which is the best bit, the middle bit? The middle or the top. The middle or the top. The, yes. you know, it's it's stiff as a board and needs plenty of soaking. They say it's a grand barometer for the weather. It picks up all the moisture in the air. For 12 hours. Life is still hard, with a bit of shore gleaning to supplement the hard-won cash. Ireland has always exported its produce. And these winkles are not for home consumption. It's only the French, like, you know, the, the homo shellfish, like snails and periwinkles, lobsters and crayfish and that, like. You must go according to the tide, like. You, you can only pick those for about a week in the winter time, like. Your tide is gone, then you must wait again then for another week for the tide to sort. Is this your living? We run social welfare as well. Down here in West Cork, good pasture and a soft climate supports plenty of small dairy farms. Milk is all important. Children help with the milking before they go off to school in the morning. Nowadays, rapid transport. Compared to a donkey and cart, this is a red Ferrari. And refrigeration means that the milk can be delivered to a central creamery. The small farmers still make the merchants a fortune, and Irish dairy products are exported all over the world. In the old days, such perishable goods had to be conserved if they were to be turned into cash in the marketplace to pay the rent. If you had a single cow, all many a peasant farmer could keep, it would take about two weeks to fill the butter barrel. You'd need two barrels to take to market. And it took three or four days to walk to Cork from here. But it was worth it because the merchants of Cork had a reputation for honesty and didn't cheat you. You did the deal, and then the merchant would desalt the butter, grade and resalt it, repack it, and sell it in the butter exchange. Charlie has dusted down one of the old-fashioned cream separators he used to turn for his mum when he was a young lad, and that was a few years ago. We're going to see if it still does its stuff. Buttermilk on one side, very good for making soda bread. 
and the cream on the other. And now into the churn with the cream and turn it until the butter comes. Sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's slow. Some people are better at it than others. But the principle is very simple. Patience does it. And if you bump the milk about for long enough, sure as eggs is eggs, you get butter. Down the road, lush pastures and cosseted cows. There's something very familiar about the machinery, though, even if electricity has replaced most of the muscle power. Bill Hogan runs a more sophisticated workshop, making pure unsalted butter, much of it for the exclusive delicatessens of London. Working it to squeeze out the water. Everyone's getting away from salt. You see, we have a great market for our own salt. So there's Ab. Yeah. Great. You carry it for me, please. Bill has another more important string to his harp. He's one of Ireland's highly successful new breed of master cheesemakers. Just a bit like junket. It takes yeah. 10 gallons of milk to make a gallon of cheese and it's only made in the summer when the cows are out on fresh grass. Never a munch of silage to spoil the flavour. This morning's new milk is mixed with a starter culture and gently warmed, coddled like a baby, until it's ripe enough for the rennet, which sets it into a soft whole curd. Scooped up for draining, a hoop of snow-white muslin Muscle power is still useful. This is curds and whey, the sort little Miss Muffet was eating just before the spider got alongside her. Bill's expertise had to be imported. The climate of Ireland was always good for butter, but too warm and damp to produce storable cheeses. But storage rooms, whose heat and humidity can be controlled at the touch of a button, have changed all that. Everything's sparkling clean. There's a lot of microbes around in cheese making, and you have to take great care. Pressing the cheese into moulds. At the end of it, Bill's cheese can only be as good as the milk which goes into it, and he handpicks the farmers who supply him. The reward is excellence. These are the cheeses, Desmond and Gabriel, rinded, ripened and matured. Swiss Emmental is the nearest, that win Bill his prizes. No preservatives, so each cheese has to be brushed individually by hand to prevent mould. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, from feast to famine, and the graveyards of Ireland have their own story to tell. Hardship comes in many guises, and none harder than the great potato famines of the 1840s. You cannot be in the countryside of Ireland without awakening memories of the great disaster which triggered the waves of emigration to the New World. A million and a half men, women and children died. There were children's graveyards all over. Famine graves are common graves, marked with rough stones, because there was no one left with the strength to bury the dead. Ironically, the famines were the result of reliance on a new world import, the potato. After its introduction, the infant mortality rate dropped and the population tripled 
from 3 million to nearly 9 million in a century. Then came the blight. Even so, Cork continued to ship out food. But these wharfs began to see a different export, the survivors of the Great Famine. Thousands migrated to the New World to escape the dark clouds of famine and poverty. Potatoes are still an important staple. In the soft climate of Ireland, the tuber flourished as nowhere else. Before the blight, an Irish peasant farmer needed only one damp acre, two weeks' labour a year, to crop enough food to feed his family. A bit of sharecropping is still usual. It is only um, less than a third of an acre I have that I got from a local priest that's here in Bellicotton. He just asked me to know would I take over this garden and clean it up and sit whatever I like to sit in it. So it's only about a third of an acre that I have grown those potatoes and I have cabbage and parsnips and carrots and onions and other stuff grown in it as well as those potatoes. I give the priest uh, whatever potatoes he need for the year. Like him, yeah, I, I feel that I wouldn't have a dinner if I wouldn't have potatoes. And, uh, all the family like him. Anne Foster is one of the few who still likes the old way of making Ireland's daily bread, brown soda bread. More than anything else, this says Ireland. Brown was the usual. White would only be for very special occasions. Roughly three. Roughly three. Gives a nice brown colour. Now, for two teaspoons of bread soda, That's about three and a half pounds of flour, a tablespoon of salt, two teaspoons of baking soda, and about two ounces of butter. And did she turn it over to you then? Um, yes, I always had uh, an interest in it, and um, she didn't mind washing and ironing, and I done I done all the baking. And you did all the baking. I done all the baking. And how was it? I mean, did she, was it, was it um, a lot of cooking for the 12 of you? It's a much wetter mix than bread. Pour in the buttermilk. It's thick, Pour isn't it? It's, it's thick, yes. And quite sour. And quite sour. Do you think that helps the raisin? It, the does, it does, it does, yes. Yeah. In preference to fresh milk, yes. And we had, what, about two pints there, didn't we? Uh, two pints, I'd say, roughly. Yeah. Flour. A little bit more brown flour. A little bit more white. Flour the board. Flour the board. A little bit of each. Feels Need nice. It. Yeah, you have to knead it light. Do you need pastry making hands or bread making hands? Um, well, you need a light a pastry making hands, actually. Yeah. Oh, look. Beautiful. Nice cushion. Nice cushion. Now, you need a good, clear, hot peat fire. It's very clear, not a peat fire, isn't it? It is, yes. Now, we'll butter them. Grease the pot. It has to be good and hot. Put the 
cuts on it, but the cross is no. Deep cut? A deep cut, because otherwise it will frack at the side. I see. Break it? No. The lid has to be hot as well. On it goes. On a hook in the chimney at exactly the right height. Coals on the top as well as underneath. It's a very effective oven. You can roast a joint, boil the bacon and cabbage or the tatties, whatever. The fire's pumped up by a built-in bellows, turned by a wheel. The fire has another use, one of Ireland's oldest trades. Blacksmith Finbar Brickley is a full-time farrier and has plenty of custom, even in these days when mechanical transport means you no longer need a horse and cart to get to market. The Irish still love their horses. They breed the best in the world. Although nowadays it's for the pleasure of them. In training for the Curra races, maybe. Well, we can all have our ambitions. Ah, the soda bread's had its 40 winks. What about that? No, And it smells really wonderful. Incredible. Did you ever no. see anything so good? There's food for free in the hedgerows of Ireland, brambles. A bit of wild gathering for our party this evening. We're going to make a very special old-fashioned dessert, which uses lots of cream. So it's as well to get the rest of the ingredients for free. What are we going to make? Here. What are we going to We're make? We're going to make, um, I'm really not quite sure, but I think it's going to be basically blackberries with a few of these crab apples in it. And and Kim Nye has the secret ingredient and her own recipe for flummery. Flummery is, um, well, my version of it is oatmeal, honey, and if you can get your paws on it, pachin, but if not, good old Irish whiskey will do. And, and you can never get your hands on pachin. Oh, no, 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 of course not, no. I mean, it's very hard to get hold of. Putting the bacon in the pot and you bring it to the boil from cold water and give it a bite an hour and a half to tender. We're expecting a dozen tonight for our party. Kim Mai is getting the flummery under control. And I'm on kitchen maid duty, what else? Honey, do you want these in here? Um, oh yes, please. Slice? Yes, I think so. Like yes, thing. Straight across? Yep, those little ones. There goes the liquor. And here well, not pochine, of course, heaven forbid. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> And here's the fruit. Here's the fruit. Does it look We're using such beautiful pots. Kim Mai's husband Stephen is a potter, as was his father before him. Maybe I should stop it a minute and I'll um Mash out any. Mix your own. Doesn't it? Yes. Probably perfect. I'll keep this one mixed. And again. Good work this time. You never peel an Irish potato. Perish the thought. You'll lose all the goodness. Cabbage all ready to go. And a lovely salmon wrapped in foil. So, I throw the cabbage in on top of the bacon in true Irish style. I think the girls have gone to um, change. You really need men around sometimes, don't you? Party time. It took a little while. 
people here. Hooray! Oh, yeah. Yeah. Declan's been doing his bit too. All the food on the table at once. We want the link down there. What do we think? That's excellent. I just cut it off and it's not thrown up in the cabbage. We have to keep Stephen under control. The Irish are wild as wild. He can carve, he's Potter's hands. You want to break bread with me? Any time. <laughs> Here's Barra. I've saved the best for him. Beautiful. Wow, look at that. No, no, where's Stephen? Let's see what do. Thank you. At long last. Thank you very much. There's an old woman in West Cork made it, and I kind of want that you find it a beard like. And it's goodbye from all of us here in West Cork. We hope you had a good time in Ireland and you'll join us next time.